theater room and also in the uh, virtual room in Zoom. We will start this lecture about, I think, three minutes, yeah. Because now is 15.44. Yes, about three minutes. We have quite a number of people here in online, I think. How many? Uh, 34. Okay. Uh, okay, Bawata, ready? Sure, yes. Jump. Baik. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, from this room, I think it's no problem. And I don't know from the online room. Anybody could hear me from online room? Yes, clear, Prof. Iwan. Uh, okay, thank you. Pak Ruko, ya tadi ya? Yeah, betul. Yeah, I cannot see the participant from here. So, uh, this afternoon we have... Kamera uh, uh, aku <laughs> so we can hear you so we have a distinct or uh, honor uh, professor from technical university of muni uh, as a young professor professor uh, walter timoto priest uh, this afternoon and as one of his program in our department uh, is to give is to deliver the uh, public lectures, yeah, Paul Walter. And today uh, he would like to give a lecture on specifically in land management issues with title Optimizing Public Social and Economic Values in Land Management. Just for a short introduction for his background, Professor Walter Timothy Priest, actually a professor in 
uh, Technical University of Munich, uh, Chair of Land Management. If we say, uh, if we say Chair, uh, I think it's not really comparable to our uh, system, yeah, because there is part of the institute, uh, right, or department, something. As for instance, you have school, and then you have chair, chair, chair. Yes. Something like that, yeah. Okay. <laughs> or maybe in German, Fachbury something. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. Paul Water will explain it himself, yeah. And then, yeah, under Chair of Land Management, School of Engineering and Design, Department of uh, Aerospace and uh, Geodesy. So from the uh, background and also from his, uh, his, from the origin of his department, uh, maybe you can already uh, say that uh, Pak uh, pa Walter background is morely, more or less uh, related to yeah, geodesy uh, and GIS something and mostly in land management as well. So uh, we have here quite a number of people also in this room. Unfortunately, the online people cannot see them. Yeah, only You can only see us, two of us. Oh yeah, we have two camera, yeah, okay, good. Thanks to technology, yeah. So you can see from different angle then. And uh, we have more or less, how many? 41, I think, yeah. Uh, participants in online uh, uh, a Zoom online room. And today, uh, Paul Walter will give the lecture for about maybe 30 minutes. And uh, yeah, if you more, need more time, you should have to use. <laughs> That's okay. So after that, maybe uh, after his presentation, then we can have kind of like of discussion, uh, uh, un uh, question and answer session. Yeah, we would like to call of you, uh, all of you to participate in this lecture. And if you have any question, you just simply maybe later on just raise your hand for the people who are attending the lecture in this room or maybe from the online uh, participant, you can also raise your hand by clicking the raise uh, hand button, okay? So uh, without further ado, I don't want to spend much time. I would like to give the time to Pa Walter to give his presentation and also the public lecture, uh, maybe for about, okay, 30 minutes, okay. Okay, please Pa Walter. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me with this, uh, at least in this room, but also online. Uh, thanks for, first of all, for, uh, for inviting me here and also allowing me to speak. Um, I hope, um, yeah, I hope we can discuss also a little bit that uh, it's not just me who is speaking, but we can have some discussion. What I want to do today is talk about values. And um, you mentioned that I'm originally uh, a geodesist. So my background is, is geodesy, but my second background is public administration. And in public administration, you talk in a very different way about values and about indicators. Uh, uh, in geodesy, we like to do things uh, very precise and accurate and measure things. Uh, and in public administration, values mean something else, uh, actually, or it has multiple meanings. And that's also what I want to talk about today. So today's lecture is more public spatial planning, land management, but more the, uh, the social side of it and the public administration side than it is the geodesy side. So we don't talk about precision and accuracy uh, today. So very shortly, uh, these are the kind of issues that I wanted to talk about uh, a little bit. Uh, first of all, what do I mean by land interventions and why do we do that? Uh, what is the continuum of, of values perhaps and um, that you see in, in land management? And then I'll talk a little bit about economic, social um, and uh, other types of values, uh, public values. And I'll end with public value capture as, as a specific topic. So first of all, let's have a look at these issues um, from a spatial planning uh, perspective and a land management perspective. Uh, 
I took these ones from LinkedIn just this morning uh, because I thought these were good examples. So if you look at these pictures, you see a sort of before and after situation. And uh, obviously, the goal of these pictures is to show that the after situation is better than the before situation. Um, but we can also say the after situation has a better value than the before situation. But the question for me is then, why is that? Uh, what is it that makes the second situation, the new situation, more valuable? And where is this value actually in? Uh, it is essentially two of the same pictures or the same locations. And we see on the left-hand side, we see that old situation. And the value is in particular in the first picture for me uh, in the amount of green and also in the maybe the lack of uh, cars in the second picture. This is a picture from, from Austria if I'm, or from Vienna, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so apparently more green and less cars has a higher value. Uh, at least for some people. And the same in the second picture, um, we see more green and less cars. So obviously this person thinks that less cars is better than more cars. Uh, but again, is that more valuable or not? Um, a second picture also shows a little bit like that, the same location, but uh, again, uh, they want to portray a certain value statement. Also, the value statement that uh, apparently more green and more walkable space has a better value or a better quality of life. Uh, maybe there it comes in as well. Um, yeah, you can debate if that is true. Uh, so from an economic perspective, you could argue, well, if you have access by cars, it, it has a better value economically because you can reach it quicker. Uh, but from maybe a public perspective or a social perspective or an ecological perspective, then more green would actually have a higher value. So there you immediately see that the value debate is, uh, is multidimensional here. Uh, and here, uh, just more for fun actually, uh, the value of transportation. I, I like this kind of pictures. Uh, how many cars do you need and how many um, other types of transport do you need for the same amount of space? So I guess this is a typical spatial planning question. Can we replace uh, cars and roads actually by something else? Uh, and you clearly see that for the roads and the cars, you need much more space than actually for alternative modes of transport. Uh, so again, this is an issue of values and of uh, priorities from, from a public sense, uh, as opposed to a private sense. So a car is maybe more valuable from a private perspective, whereas the use of space has more value from a public perspective. Um, and here uh, is also something which talks about values, but in a completely different way. Uh, this is a picture taken from a newspaper article from, from last week. House prices in Munich rise once again, but maybe uh, the increase of values is not so much. But is this actually values or is this prices? Uh, the prices increase, but the value of the same building, is that increasing, yes or no? Or or are we talking about the same thing, value as prices? Uh, so that raises a question and here also about land prices in uh, land and house prices in, in Germany. And you see that the land and the house prices in Munich, where I'm from, is actually the highest uh, and also is uh, increasing a lot. Uh, now, this is just also um, the value of houses and also the, the value of, um, for example, renting houses uh, is very expensive. But here we talk uh, about values in a purely economic uh, way in terms of amount of money that you need to pay for uh, a particular apartment or a particular house or a piece of land. Uh, so again, um, we look at value in a completely different way. Now, let's go back one step and, and look at the issue of um, what is it that we can actually do in space. And how I define land management is um, as an active uh, or as a science and a practice that intervenes into space. Actually, it changes the, uh, the use of land, the quality of land, um, and it does so by making 
uh, so-called interventions. Uh, so we change the things by, by intervening into space and into the properties of space, such as the rights. And the ultimate um, uh, impact of that intervention is actually also multidimensional. So uh, if you intervene in land, you change the governance of land, you change the, the legal issues of land, you change the social spatial relations to land, uh, you change economic opportunities uh, related to, to space, uh, you change the perceptions. If we change uh, something in land, as we saw in the first couple of pictures, we actually also change the perceptions, how we look at our, our surrounding environment, and we change the behavior. Uh, as we saw with the last picture of transportation, we definitely change how people actually go from one place to another. But the ultimate goal of that is to increase the value of the land. Uh, and uh, I make there a clear distinction between private values and public values and other types of values. Uh, the public values are actually the values for the entire community or for the entire society, whereas the private values are the values uh, or maybe the benefits for particular individuals. And I think this difference is important in our debate on what is actually the values that we should uh, try to strive for. What is it that we want to achieve with uh, a land management intervention? Do we want to enhance the public values or do we want to enhance the, uh, the private values or do we want to enhance both? Uh, and how do we translate those public and private values into economic terms, social terms, and, and maybe also ecological terms? From the three examples or four examples that I showed you, you clearly see there is a difference of public and private benefits that you get from the before and after situation, and also the economic values in, in both those situations and social values, uh, they change a lot uh, as well. So this is this sort of continuum of, of values, in my opinion, as a result of, of land interventions or, or interventions into space in general. Um, so what are these economic values? Uh, now, this is a lot to read, uh, I, I admit. Uh, but a lot of the discussions on economic values are, in that sense, um, maybe a little bit boring, you could say. Um, if you talk to economists, they can talk for hours and hours about economic values and market prices and, and things like that. But you have to go into the details of what a market value really means and what uh, a market value, how a market value is also different from, um, from a price, for example, or from a price at a particular moment in time. In general, you can say that uh, a market value is the sort of constant or coherent amount of money that um, an average person or the average group of people would give for a certain piece of land or a certain uh, building. Uh, and a market value, or if you express economic value in terms of market value, you reduce actually the economic value to just that price which is there in the market. There's actually lots of other things that could be included in an economic value. Uh, you could say there's also the opportunity costs. There is uh, lots of other costs and benefits uh, that you can lay to the, uh, relate to the economic value, but the market value is a sort of reduction of that economic value into an average value of a particular uh, piece of land or a building at a particular moment in time uh, on average. So it is not an individual, what an individual would give to it because an individual may actually give any sort of money for any piece of land or any, any kind of building, uh, but that is not the value. That is sort of the transaction uh, or the price that somebody pays for that. So in that sense, um, market value is, is quite clearly determined into, into theory. And also, if you look to general theories or economic theories, like uh, uh, the ground rent theory, for example, um, you could say that the value of land and property is uh, also related to the conditions of the land and also to the land use planning in itself. By planning, you de facto 
hope to increase the value of that land. So you hope to get a better price for that land or for that property after land use planning as compared to before the land use planning. So, uh, and you can translate that then also into a goal of land use planning is to enhance the economic value. In the rural sense, that is perhaps more clear. If you do a land consolidation, then uh, the amount of land and maybe the profit that you get from the land should be better or more after a land consolidation process than before a land consolidation process. But in the urban context, that is sometimes a little bit more complicated. Uh, if you uh, renovate a building or if you change maybe uh, the amount of roads or the access to certain buildings, if you make infrastructure, the one-to-one -one connection um, to that is, is not always very clear because you may actually change the entire neighborhood and therefore also uh, create lots of other facilities and services within that region, uh, which before you didn't have. So the comparison of before and after is not always very evident in that case. Um, but essentially, uh, the value increase, you should be able to calculate with an economic return. Again, this is a bit of a theoretical story. Um, what that means in practice is, is very often very different. Now, the, if we purely go into the theory of valuation, um, and there's also professors in land valuation, and I don't um, uh, say that I'm actually a professor in land valuation. There are colleagues that do that much better, but essentially we could say, uh, we could borrow from the definitions uh, of land valuation. Generally, land value is expressed in the market value and not in the economic value. Um, so that means that um, if the government says this is the value of a particular piece of space, uh, space or of a property, then they use the market value in most cases. And that is usually the value for which, uh, if, for which they determine, for example, compensation in case there is expropriation or in case they need a part of that piece of land. Uh, so very often they use that uh, market value, which is the average value of that particular uh, space that someone or that a group of people would pay for that. Uh, that is, I guess, the technical story. And as said, and this is explained in this slide, that uh, usually the philosophy of that valuation, why do you do valuation in the first place, is because you need to pay an, a certain amount for displacement or for expropriation in case you want to make an intervention into space. And that's why they made a valuation in the first place. Uh, but often you also need valuation for another purpose, and that is taxation. Um, but very often these two systems are completely different. Like in Indonesia, the tax is based on another value than uh, actually the the expropriation or the displacement, uh, those are two different systems. In a way that strains, at least to me, that is very strange. Uh, why do they have a different value? Well, the background is that the purpose is, is also different. So if you want to uh, pay someone for a displacement, then you usually take other factors into account. Uh, but you also want it to be very objective in the sense that everybody has a sort of same mechanism of uh, calculation of, uh, of the value of that particular space. So that's why uh, some sort of objectivity is, is always crucial in, in these sort of economic value calculations. And here comes the crux into how economic values are different from social and public values. Uh, it is this difference between objectivity and subjectivity. Um, economic values need to be objective and transparent. And it is for that reason that they need to display exactly how those values are calculated. Whereas social values, they are by nature subjective. Um, and I'll explain what, what I think social values are and how you can deal with social values in that case. Uh, there's also a legal issue, of course. Uh, so compensation and expropriation obviously has legal uh, implications. Um, 
what is often not uh, covered in um, in uh, compensation and, and also in evaluation are the subjective values. So how is it that individual people think and perceive the relevance of that area? So if you are very attached to an area, uh, if, is it, if this is your home of the parents, uh, if this is where you grew up, then automatically you feel more attached to it. Uh, you, if somebody destroys that building, you feel very upset uh, because you have affinity with that building. But that subjective value or emotional value is often not covered in economic calculations. Uh, only in some countries. Uh, in Germany, it's not covered. But in uh, Sweden, for example, it is covered. So if somebody is uh, expropriated and they have some major disadvantage or they get uh, depressed or something, um, then actually you can also compensate for that. Uh, and there are some official regulations that a certain amount up to 25% uh, can also be included in the, in the compensation costs. So here you see already that uh, there is some difference between countries in, in the type of uh, value systems, economic value systems. Um, but the question is, how do we deal with that? Because um, where does the value come from in the first place? Uh, we saw in the first couple of pictures that the intervention is very often a public intervention. So it is not an intervention that comes from the individual owner of that space. It can be. If you have a house and you actually improve the house, then obviously it is your direct uh, influence on the value of that particular uh, house itself. You improve the house itself. Huh? Or if you start with, with nothing and you build a house, then actually you create value by itself. And then it is also right that uh, you get compensated for the inc increase of that value. But if it's actually a planning authority or a government that uh, influences that value increase, then there is an argument that the government should also be awarded for that increase in value. Uh, and that is the sort of basis of um, public value capture, that if the government or the planning agency increases the value of your land, as we saw in the Austrian example, uh, the first couple of pictures, uh, we make green, and then the value of that property and the value of that land gets bigger, then the government should also have a right to, to capture some of that value back in some sort of form, uh, because it's not you who actually increases the value. And also in the Munich examples, um, the rent of my house in Munich gets bigger, higher and higher and higher. Uh, I don't do anything for that, but I have to pay more. Uh, it's not that I, um, I increase the value of that space. I simply live there, but the, the rent gets higher. Uh, and that is a couple of reasons, because the, the owner needs to pay more tax, but also the value of the property gets bigger because the surrounding area gets improved. There's a new station nearby, there's a new bus line nearby. These are all public uh, facilities that need to be paid for. So somehow the owner needs to pay more tax, and therefore that tax um, and also the value increase is, uh, is being paid by the people that rent that place. So there is a public value capture, which is also indirect in this case uh, by the public. Um, but how this value increase is also at the discretion of the public authorities. Uh, public authorities can also decide, okay, we think there is a, a value increase and then decide that the value of that property in this location is higher. So, in that sense, a value increase also has political connotations. Um, so how is value increasing over time? Um, in Germany, we make use of the so-called uh, stairs model, and maybe I should go there uh, straight away, that um, by developing a certain area, you gradually increase the value in, in a number of steps. So in the preparation of uh, a land use plan, you actually already increase the value. Uh, and we can see that in, in very clear examples. If you say that there will be a, a bridge or a new building in a new area, then automatically the value of that land gets 
gets higher without any intervention even simply the announcement that there will be uh, uh, something happening will increase the value then once the uh, the development starts then the value will increase again once the building is there then the value will increase once the buildings are occupied then the value will increase too so you see that uh, at various points in time value increases so value also follows this sort of stairs model of um, value um, incrementations uh, you could say value increases um, and you also see that in in a rural context uh, value at the end of a land consolidation process should be more than uh, the value after uh, before the land uh, consolidation uh, process I'll skip this a little bit also in view of time because I want to go to the social values. Uh, social values follow a completely different logic, at least in my opinion. Um, how are social values different from economic values? First of all, they are more subjective, but social values are also constructed through social interaction. So uh, you could say there is an intrinsic value into property, but there's also a, a value that comes through social interaction. If I have a good, uh, friendly uh, conversation with my neighbors, then I gradually build up a social relation with my neighbors, and that leads to more cohesion in the neighborhood. Um, in, in Holland, we would say, um, or in English, we would say neighborship. In, in Platt Deutz and in Platt um, Dutch, also we say neighborship. We are neighbors. We are kind of neighbor, and we are also good neighbors. Um, in in the old Indonesian, there was always gotong royong. I, I remember. I don't know if that still exists actually, but uh, it's actually um, neighbors that together clean the neighborhood. But that cleaning or cleaning together also increases the value of that neighborhood because the entire community has a benefit from that. Uh, so this is typically a social value whereby not just the value increases by a better uh, physical environment, but also by better social relations. People are happy to live there, they feel more safe, um, and they also um, could, for example, leave their children with their neighbor. They feel confident that that is safe. And if you live in a neighborhood where you don't feel comfort, uh, comfortable with your neighbors, uh, in fact, uh, in Munich, I don't know my neighbors. So uh, I don't feel comfortable to leave anything with my neighbors. Now, that is for me uh, also a social value of not a very coherent neighborhood, uh, that you don't know your neighbors. Uh, so this is typically a social value, and with that come also other social values, security, cohesion, willingness to participate, willingness to contribute to gotong royong or cleaning the street in your neighbors, willingness to actually participate also in the spatial planning process. So if there's a new uh, sort of environment or a new plan for that neighborhood, then you are willing to contribute if you feel part of that neighborhood. Now, these, in my opinion, are social values which are socially constructed. And they are different from public values because public values are very often associated with also public goals and public administration, politics, and things like that. And they're also different from human values which are more universal, like uh, human rights and uh, uh, human identities. These are typically human values. Social values, in my opinion, are typically these socially constructed values. Uh, and um, I have a couple of examples of that. Um, and I wanted to show that in this table. Now, for the audience, I'm not really sure if this is directly visible, but this comes from an article which we wrote about economic versus social values. But when you look at the social values here, you see a summary of all sorts of social and public values which are often forgotten in a lot of economic land use or economic oriented land use planning or land, land management. Things like security, cohesion, uh, uh, connectedness, um, uh, feeling part of the system. Uh, these sort of values, uh, they must be taken into account, especially in spatial planning and to land management. But often they are less tangible than the economic values and also uh, cannot be measured uh, very well. And this is still problematic 
because uh, many of these social values, they are not acknowledged in sort of the official um, monitoring systems, enforcement systems, and also evaluation systems. To which degree is a, a land use plan or is a spatial intervention or land management intervention also adhering or improving these kind of values? Um, so my argument would be we, we need to do more about, uh, about that. Now, how do we connect then these multiple value systems? Um, uh, this is a big task. Um, the way that economists look at that is simply translate the social value into economic terms. So monetize a social value. That is what an economist would say. Um, oh, you talk about security, then what does security cost? And what, does, uh, what is the benefit of security? What sort of cost can you avoid? So if there's more security, you can avoid police. How much does the police cost? Okay, this is the amount of savings really in monetary terms. Uh, but from a social perspective, I would translate it into, and that's also when you want to optimize it, I think you have to translate it into other issues. Uh, the amount of police uh, is not just an economic factor. It is also uh, a sense of quality of life in general. Uh, so you, you need to measure these things in other terms, quality of life, uh, security maybe in general on a scale of one to 10 rather than into an economic term. So, but what that means is that you need to reconcile these different kind of logics and rationalities. And one way to do it is to look for so-called boundary objects. A boundary object is um, obviously as a geodesist, uh, when you talk about boundaries, these are physical boundaries. Uh, these are lines uh, that we can measure with coordinates. Uh, but the nice thing about boundaries is that they are both dividing, but also sharing. We share the boundary and it also divides us. Uh, and in social terms, that also means, um, and in epistemic terms, boundaries, uh, they divide us, but also they unite us. So we need to look what is actually the uniting part of um, social values as opposed to economic values? What unites it? And I think it is this system of valuation, but maybe also in certain technologies that we can measure things uh, or maybe grade things to, to a certain uh, degree. So we need to look for um, methodologies and epistemologies that, um, that seek these boundary objects. So uh, in the old days, there was always uh, looking for the, um, yeah, there was this old movie, uh, Desperately Seeking Susan. Now, uh, I can check your age. Uh, who knows the movie Desperately Seeking Susan? Uh, anybody in the audience? Who knows Desperately Seeking Susan? Who knows Madonna as a singer? Oh, everybody knows Madonna as a singer. Madonna played in that movie. And uh, the whole goal of that movie, and Madonna was the Susan, that uh, someone was actually desperately seeking Susan. Uh, but actually, in our model, we are desperately seeking the boundary artifacts, or the boundary objects. So what is actually the methodology or the sort of logic that unites uh, social rationality with, with economic rationality. Uh, and this is something that I guess we're still looking for because translating one to the other, in my opinion, is not sufficient. Translating social uh, values into economic terms and also uh, economic values into social terms is not sufficient. We should actually look for new value systems that um, that can actually translate, um, that can actually work for both sort of logics. Um, and here is some, some first work into that. There's lots of logics of value system. So we, we investigated that also in, uh, in this particular article. There's actually lots of epistemologies to look at values. And these are the things that we need to reunite with each other. Um, why is that? Because um, often we look at forgotten values. Um, so if we do land interventions, then we want to include certain values which we can't see. And uh, I use that as pictures here. 
Well, what do you see actually? Uh, what do you see in these pictures? Uh, yeah, you see pictures. You see pictures of uh, cars, uh, but it's actually uh, in both and the other ones you see buildings. Uh, but it's actually an invisible man here. So a man which made himself invisible. Uh, I like that perspective. And you can see that here. He's actually blending in with the environment. Uh, and here you see how they do that. They paint him exactly like the environment itself. Um, so you see that here and uh, standing in front of a bookshelf. And you see that actually the man stands in front of that bookshelf. And now you look at that picture again. He, is, he stands in front of... There's actually someone there. Uh, now, what I want to show with this is that um, very often if we do land use planning, there's lots of social perspectives that we don't see. So these invisible people are often, nowadays we speak in the, in the political discourse very often of a sort of silent group in society, which is actually the majority that we they don't speak up and, and that we don't see. And very often um, we need to include them in our land use uh, planning process, in our land management process. We need to see those hidden people in order to, uh, to, to gain those uh, different perspectives. And that's why we also need to not only focus on economic perspectives, but also on the social perspectives, which are often forgotten in these value uh, debates. Uh, so that's what I wanted to show with that. Uh, um, now, one way that is sort of maybe also a boundary object is also this public value capture. Uh, the whole idea as said is um, that any sort of value increase in economic terms should get back to the society in general. And uh, public value capture is therefore also a way that uh, if the public invests in enhancing your environment, then they should also be rewarded or the government should also have the right to, to take some of that money that is in that intrinsic value increase back into society. So it should not just go to the private individual that simply has the ownership of that house and simply waits, sits back, like the owner of my house just sat back and every year I had to pay more money and that owner was very happy without doing anything. So, and I was very unhappy with that value increase. It would go better if that value increase also came back to me as a member of the society. And that is what this public value capture is all about. Government should have the right to get that money back. Question is, however, how do they get that money back? So, uh, the various debates uh, actually say there's lots of ways in which value is increasing, first of all. And there's also different ways, and this is the same picture, uh, where and when this value increase uh, takes place. But how do you actually get it back? Now, there's two fundamental ways in which you can capture that money. The first is direct, and that is actually asking for money, uh, fees, for example, for any... Uh, any transaction. Um, you can also say if, if somebody improves, then immediately you ask money for that. So a betterment uh, condition. So there's various direct ways in which you can uh, get that money back if, if there is a value increase. But there's also indirect ways. And indirect ways are usually taxes. So public gets the money back for any sort of value increase that, uh, that uh, occurs in that area. So but then there's different taxes. Now, taxes are very often based on how the value takes place. And in some countries, it is purely based on the land, land value. And in other countries, it is, it is based on the land value and the property value. So the taxes, uh, property taxes can be based on both. And, and different countries have, have different systems. But you immediately realize that if you only base tax on, on land value, then there are certain negative side effects. You have to have either two systems of property tax, uh, land value N, and property itself, uh, or you need to combine that. So there's different, most of the times, uh, if you purely base the sort of land value capture uh, only on the land value increase, 
then the negative side effect is that um, you may actually, uh, or the correlation between the land value and the increase may not may not be there. The land value or the property value may actually increase because of completely different reasons. Uh, whereas if you have a separate uh, property tax, both on land and on property, then uh, especially land in itself, the value of land doesn't increase very rapidly. It is usually the property that increases because of the circumstances then it is much closer to the actual situation of uh, or the actual reason for the value increase of that property. So that second option seems to be a better scenario in most cases. Um, so what kind of taxes you can, so what is actually the instrument of land taxation? Uh, first of all, you can have that direct land tax or property tax. These are the common systems. But there's also other ways of, of raising taxes. You can have a service tax. Let's say if there's a particular service increase, uh, for example, there's a new bus line or a new MRT close to your house, uh, then you can uh, raise a tax for that, in particular uh, for that particular, or maybe even if there's better waste disposal, you can also, um, so that's in a way also an indirect uh, public value capture system. If there is a better servicing system, you can um, include it in that. You can also include it in the property transfer. So if you sell it for a high price, then in the property transfer fee, you can include it there. You can uh, include it in the development tax or in a sort of capital gains tax. Um, and especially the latter is interesting for people that only invest in property. Um, and have the benefit of those investments. Um, in, in Germany, but also in the Netherlands, there's many people that simply invest in the land and they don't actually do anything and in the property, but they don't do anything about it. But they gain lots of money. Uh, these big investment companies, um, they actually invest in land also to pay for the pensions of most of the public uh, servants. Uh, so my... My pension is very much dependent on, on the investments into real estate. Uh, so I hope my pension will be high, but that is only high if, if the property is also very high. So I have a dual position. I'm sort of advocating a low price for the property, but then I'm also advocating a low pension. So uh, that's a dilemma, of course. Uh, but there you can obviously also raise a tax. So for those people and those companies that have a high benefit without doing anything, but simply wait, you can impose a higher tax in that, uh, in that particular value system. Good, so what are obstacles in general? So public value capture um, is not an easy system to introduce. Uh, there must be an official regulations in the constitution. And I'm actually not sure for the Indonesian case, if there is a constitutional right of the public agencies to, to have a public value capture. Uh, so if there's an increase, can they also increase the taxes uh, just like that? But there must be a constitutional mechanism that allows public agencies to increase the tax if the value is also increasing. Um, also, the legal norms that you have that direct relation of uh, public value capture must be there. Another difficulty is that um, many sort of cities are growing informally and, and there we don't have an official value or we don't have an official tax system. So uh, in many of these informal growth and settlements, uh, it's very confusing what, what is the value of that property. Um, a very major issue is also the tax collection. Um, many people are not there if the, <laughs> if, the, if the tax collector comes there or fail or forgot to pay. And that can, yeah, um, that's actually for all tax collections. Um, we have a car, but we also have a family that is, uh, or actually a relative in the family that is working for the tax agency. And, he on his app he found out he, he used that app and simply typed the the plate number of the car then he found out ah i'm sorry to tell you but you're two weeks late with your tax uh, payment uh, 
So the increase, the denda is already <laughs> 50,000 or something like that rupiah, um, which we were not aware of because it just said month seven of 2022. Uh, I thought that was the end of the month, uh, but it was apparently the, the 11th of the month or, the, or earlier than that. But anyway, uh, tax collection is obviously in many countries also a big problem. Uh, major companies in Western Europe, they don't pay tax or they forget to pay or they lose. They use all sorts of ways not to pay tax. So tax collection is a major issue in many countries, not just developing countries. And corruption and maybe transparency issues uh, is, is also a major problem in many countries. Uh, so that is a major issue. Um, and maybe also for the people that are interested in this public value capture research, um, there are some major projects ongoing. Uh, a big project in, in Europe is a public value uh, capture project um, of which many universities are a member and they have regular conferences on that. Uh, the website is here also. Uh, there's also a nice uh, OECD report, um, which makes a nice overview of public uh, value capture mechanisms and rules in, in a number of countries. That was done in cooperation with the Lincoln Institute in, in the US. And recently, uh, I think it was this year or last year, there was also um, in the journal Sustainability, a special issue on public value capture. So recent research on public value capture is also um, is updated and is also a nice topic for master and doctoral thesis uh, research for example so to summarize a little bit and and my apologies for crossing the the half an hour uh, with some minutes uh, um, i think uh, we really need to understand that these value systems, they have different uh, attributes. So there is um, definitely a difference between the spatial values or the economic values and the, uh, and the social values in terms of objectivity and subjectivity. Also, the objective values, they can often be monetarized, I would say, whereas the uh, social values can often not be monetarized, in my, my opinion. So we need other metrics for that, in my opinion, because they are socially constructed, they are, meaning that they are constructed into uh, social processes. Um, and therefore, we need to include that. So things like legitimacy, um, uh, community values. Uh, um, I think we need to we need to find other metrics for that. But they are also, in a way, to a certain degree, uh, connected to the uh, to the public administration system. Also, public uh, planning and authority activities they need to be acknowledged as being contributing to the value increase. But that also implies that um, they need some sort of uh, enforcement and authority. So public value capture, as I was saying, um, has the difficulty of the enforcement, the policing, and, and also the tax collection, for example. But that has a direct relation with, uh, with leg legitimacy and also acceptance of, of the governments as, as an important player. Um, also, in terms of uh, being uh, an active member in, in land policies, for example, uh, very often they are passive members, uh, as we see in, in, the, in the Jabotabek region in particular, where is actually lots of private development and the role of government has been reduced to almost zero. So as a legitimate player and authoritative player, I think we need to, um, yeah, we need to reinforce a little bit the, the role of the, the government as a sort of uh, unpartisan uh, player in that in that field and I think um, we need to acknowledge that there is also public benefits in in capturing the public value so uh, that is also an important element and last but not least from a scientific perspective we need to work on a combination of epistemologies so logics and rationalities of uh, economic and social values so that was it. Uh, I know there's a lot of text, uh, and but we can have a discussion maybe based on the questions. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah.
Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Pa Walter, for your nice uh, presentation. Also, nice lecture for this afternoon. And I suppose we have some new insight. What is public uh, benefit, social value, economic value as well? Uh, in relation to uh, land use planning, land management, and also the uh, property and building tax issues, yeah, in the presentation. Actually, I have some questions as well, but I will do it later <laughs> at the end of the lecture. I mean, there are some uh, nice issues that can be raised from this lecture yeah, about uh, social value and economic value, yeah. Uh, in relation to the uh, public capture value. So I think we will have some, this. I will have some uh, question on that later on. But before that, I would like to call to the participant here, maybe the people, uh, oh, we already have some question. Yeah, it is very small from here, yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> So maybe I can move to the monitor <laughs> and read the question is signed. Before to the online participant, anybody would like to have a question from this room maybe? Oh, we have two questions. Okay, so uh, let me ask the people here first and then we go to the online uh, Zoom room. Okay, please. Bu Butere ya, ya, uh, ya pakai ini ya, bu. Uh, my name is Tegan. Uh, major degree is in city planning, but I never practice as my uh, job. Only uh, as a, a citizen concern about the city. So I have a community movement in public transportation campaign, uh, safety walking to uh, encourage uh, government to build the uh, sidewalk, uh, safety sidewalk. Uh, start from 2015. Uh, also start to uh, encourage my neighbor, my friend to plant the trees, my ways. Uh, deliver the trees, provide the trees for free. So I get it free too, or I uh, get donation from my friends. Start from 2018. So I like your pictures, uh, adding the public transportation. Activities. You mentioned that government can uh, set up the higher tax if government improve the environment. How about if uh, individual uh, improve uh, their land, maybe they have big land with many trees, with uh, better for runoff, uh, water runoff. Is it uh, already practiced in developed country that that house will be get uh, lower tax for land tax? Because in Indonesia, the land tax is set up every three years, but we don't know how the, how the scheme, <laughs> who set up the so mayor, uh, give our my tax another three years, maybe four times up. We don't know what is the calculation. So in pers ecology perspective, I hope that uh, Improving environmental must be from all citizens. And is the instant uh, will be lower tax rent. So what do you think about that? Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you for that, for that comment. I think uh, it's a very valuable comment because you raised there uh, an important issue in city development is also active citizens. Uh, now, active citizens for me is um, what I mentioned as a, a social quality. I think you would like to have more active citizens um, because then you also create more responsibility and accountability for citizens in that area. People take uh, the, the responsibility in their own hands, 
but that also enhances the quality of living because they feel part of that community and they will respect uh, the, the area better. I think what you see in Western countries is more and more um, these sort of movements as well. So grassroots movements to, to take care of uh, the property, also as a response to the increasing uh, higher prices and higher taxes for land and property. They say, look, uh, why don't we as a community invest in this land? Because we have to live there and we get the benefit. Why is it that we should only pay tax for this without any reason, uh, without any sort of the value increase is not to the benefit of us, goes to the benefit of investors, uh, of outsiders, people that don't even live in that area. So we see uh, gradually these sort of movements uh, picking up. An interesting example in that respect, so, First of all, I like the idea of, uh, of having more trees and also sideways uh, walking areas. In general, more public space. Um, that is, uh, in Indonesia, you miss a lot of public space in, uh, in a lot of areas. Uh, the public space is in shopping malls, uh, it seems. That's where people meet, uh, but not in residential areas. A simple thing like a playground, for example, uh, the other days we were looking for a playground for, for some of our um, cousins uh, and we didn't know where to go. There was no playground for them. We had to go to a shopping mall uh, uh, and then pay 50,000 uh, rupiah, which is not that much, but still uh, it's not a public space. It is sort of a privatized uh, space. There should be public space. Also sports, where can you do sports? The children like to run or play football. Uh, there's very limited amount of space for that, which is in the major cities. Uh, and then I'm really talking about the Diabotabek region. And, but then also in Samarang, it's a bit hilly, so maybe it's a little bit more difficult. But even there, uh, where do you play badminton on the street? Uh, things like that, or in, in public areas. So there you need uh, perhaps a, a lot of um, improvements. Uh, but that needs to have the support from local populations. People must also want it like that. Uh, but definitely your issue of about who benefits and who pays for it. I think taxes should not be at the expense of citizens. It should actually be done together with citizens. If you, and maybe they should even uh, give subsidies and incentives for citizens that uh, take the initiative to improve their neighborhoods instead of sort of um, yeah, punishing them <laughs> financially for that improvement. I think there is a lot to gain, yeah. Question from the uh, on online participant, yeah? Not to fill out the participant attendance. No, that, that's not the question, yeah. Good afternoon, Professor Walter. This question from Devi Yulianti. Yeah? I am Devi from Public Administration Department at Lampung University. Oh, it's Lampung. It's very far away. Ah, you were there, yeah? You stayed there also in Lampung, yeah? It was in 80 something, yeah? It's a long time ago, right? I joined summer course, uh, last week nice to hear you lecture on public oh, she also attend from your uh, last week lecture also my question are could we do social accounting to um, to monetize a public values the first question and the second question can we create policy advocacy to mediate all parties to decide values among values trade-off something like that so Yes, I, okay. I think two important questions. Here is typically someone from public administration. You, you, you hear that immediately. Your background as well. Um, so this first is more a public management or public financing question. Can we do social accounting to monetize? Uh, definitely you can do that. That's what I said. The, um, the sort of accounting and monetizing of social values can be done. Uh, you can uh, translate it into... Uh, opportunity costs, you can translate it into transaction costs for society if you use an institutional perspective. So, and you can even make it uh, 
purely a monetary value. So in that sense, the accounting principles would, would apply. But I am not, and from an economic perspective and a public uh, accounting perspective, that is often done. But I would um, also advocate to look for new sort of systems for, uh, for social accounting, really in the social sense, uh, that we need new types of accounting systems and evaluation systems to evaluate to which degree have we increased quality of life or social cohesion or uh, perception of safety in a certain area. Uh, if I look to the news nowadays that uh, many people get robbed and killed and uh, that also gives a feeling of a lot of insecurity and, and public unsafety. Uh, and that's what you want to avoid in the long run. And I think if you would purely look at that from an economic or monitoring, uh, monetizing perspective, I don't think that uh, would be the only way to look at it. Uh, the other question was more into the uh, mediation, and I think that's also a public administration and policy question. Um, the sort of differences between groups in society, um, yeah, definitely you need to, uh, to mediate there, uh, both for sort of citizen groups, as, as we've heard here, uh, in connection to also public authorities at, at any sort of level. Very often there is a big uh, gap also between what the planners in the offices uh, create and what uh, citizen groups also create. So we definitely need a sort of translation and also mediation between those goals. Um, and we also need a mediation between the, um, the scientific communities. It's very difficult to talk to an economist or to a lawyer uh, about these issues because they talk their own language and uh, it's very difficult to make the bridge between those scientific domains. Yeah. Yeah. I hope I answered that question. Yeah, I think, I think so you already answered the question. Yeah, the, the first and second question is, sorry. The first question was actually was question as well, yeah. <laughs> How to monetize this social uh, value? Yeah. Okay. Next from this room, uh, Professor Vivi. Uh, I think we still have time until seventeen fifteen because we start quite late. Yeah. Okay. Please, Vivi. Thank you, and first, uh, thank you for the nice presentation. Interesting presentation, Pa Walter. Uh, maybe now we move from the public administration question to the urban and regional <laughs> planning questions. <laughs> yeah, I would like to know your further opinion, yeah, because uh, you have explained about the uh, social value concept, economic value, market value concept. But when we further check, we have uh, in urbanization theory, we have the uh, phenomena uh, showing that uh, in the urban development process, there is a stage where the urban is likely to expand rapidly and creating a very uh, massive uh, settlement in the peri-urban or in the urban fringe. And at the same time, uh, uh, there is a phase where the city center, uh, because of the highest maybe land price or maybe the market value or maybe, <laughs> I don't know, maybe you can further explain yeah, uh, the combination between the social, economic, and the market value, then uh, in some spot in the urban uh, or in the city center, we know that some spot becomes empty because of the people. Uh, like in Semarang, uh, most of the initial, initially they're kampung with the dense area in the city center, and they move to the uh, peri-urban area. Because at the same, because maybe the land price is too high, and maybe at the same time they likely to sell the the the, the land, and change yeah the and changing the land use from the settlement in the older era to the commercial era uh, to to the commercial use, but because of several reasons, then there's no investor to redevelop again uh, the 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 city center that initially functioned as the settlement, and it happens in many cities, I suppose, including in uh, Semarang, you can see a very, actually, it's very strategic spot. For example, like close to Simpang Lima or maybe in the kampung, not too far from the very prestigious with the height, maybe land uh, or market price. But 
there's nothing, uh, no activity there because of several uh, reasons. Yeah, I just want to know further your opinion. How you connect this situation with the concept of uh, you explained before? Yeah, uh, the combination between the social, economic, and uh, market uh, value. Yeah. I hope you can <laughs> get my point here, Paul. Yes, uh, yes, I do. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. We see the same phenomena in uh, also in Germany itself that uh, it is economically more uh, interesting to build outside of the city than to build or rebuild within the city. So if you look at pure economic terms, the land is cheaper, uh, investments are cheaper because you don't need to renovate, so you don't need to destroy first and then to build or, or to renovate the building. So it's much cheaper to build outside of the city. Um, but then you get this, indeed, what we call the donut effect. So you get the outer rings and inside you get actually nothing or deteriorating uh, centers. Uh, now, what can you do about that? I think... And here comes the issue of combining social interests and economic interests is to force any developer, or first of all, to, to limit the expansion. So there is in Germany definitely the, um, the strategy to avoid sort of outer uh, development, a development outside of the existing built up area. So you have to avoid that. To, so that leads to more compact cities. Now, the discussion is also more compact cities will lead to higher values within the city, so that that's a dilemma. Uh, and in order to combat that, they say, well, you have to build within the cities, but you also have to take care of social factors. So one of the strategies in Munich, for example, is that 20% of the new buildings, they must be for social housing or subsidized housing, so that you get multiple... Um, multiple groups within society that should benefit. And there's also a hard uh, requirement to have a certain amount of green space within the new areas that you develop or redevelop. So, and that's what they refer to as this Bauland model. And a certain amount of areas, that's what they also do in the new plans, where communities or groups or associations can actually have the freedom to build in the way that they want to build. So like these citizens initiatives that they say, they get the responsibility to build for themselves and also to allocate the land and the housing for themselves in the way that they want. So there are certain limits uh, or certain percentages in the new building strategies. And I think that's where these value systems come together. So it's not just profitable, but it's also socially and publicly desirable to build in a certain manner. Um, in the area where, where we live, you you see a lot of uh, buildings that are actually for families. Uh, um, but there's also some physical constraints. The buildings should not have all the same height. So you create automatically diversity in the area that has a couple of advantages. It has the advantages that not all the buildings look the same. So variety creates a better quality of space. But it also has um, uh, climate uh, effects. If you have uh, high and low buildings, then you also get wind in the area automatically because of the differences in height. So it has a sort of cooling effect for the area. Plus, there must be an, an, a certain amount of green space in that area. So you have a sort of double climate effect in uh, for that. So different heights as well as green areas, uh, a number of percentages of green areas uh, must be included. Now, these sort of measures... Um, they can be imposed, but that assumes that the government also has an influence. Um, what you see a lot in the private development is that they don't care too much about those sort of qualities. They simply say, okay, we want to sell as many houses as possible. So they occupy indeed as much uh, of the area with um, yeah, with houses, um, regardless of what price, uh, the, the highest bidder counts. Uh, so if they can sell to somebody that pays, they will sell to, some, but then only the economic attributes count. I think it's important that social and ecological values, such as greening, public space, uh, climate effects uh, should also be taken into account into further development. But that requires indeed 
strong government or somewhat strong authoritative government and enforcement uh, and also trust in, in government that they can do it and deliver that. Uh, yeah. Maybe it requires even that the government should be should become an owner of the land more than uh, more than before, so an active uh, player on the market. Uh, but then again, you must have trust in the government that they do the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, a nice issue, yeah. yeah. I remember when I was the first time in Munich, I need to learn for one week. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the area of the TUM in Arkistrasse yeah. because everything's look the same. <laughs> And I get lost many times, you know. <laughs> and luckily, they have a new building with the black one on the, I, I don't know, in which side, yeah, close to Lidl. So from that one, then I can distinguish. So this is where I start. OK, that was yeah, a long time ago. OK, now we will continue with the question from the, the online participants. OK. There is a question from Ucha. Ucha, I think this is a nickname, something, yeah. From Unibos. Unibos is University of Bosowa. This is in uh, Makassar. Uh, we have a very diverse uh, participant, actually. Yeah. Wait, wait. Where is the question? Please scroll up, yeah. <laughs> What is your what is Professor Walters' opinion regarding land value capture on transportation network infrastructure development? Can this method be used in the construction of new cities? Okay. Yes, okay. Uh, I think uh, transportation infrastructure will increase the value uh, immediately. So. Uh, the question is who benefits from that value increase and who actually uh, created the, uh, the infrastructure. If the infrastructure is created by private parties, then generally, uh, like the Jalan toll, then generally you get the money back through the, the payment for the toll. Uh, if the infrastructure is, however, generated by the, uh, by the government, like in, uh, in Germany for many cases, uh, then uh, the government ha also has a right to, to capture the value that is increasing because of the increase of access. Uh, so in that sense, uh, infrastructure is a very important component uh, for value capturing, uh, a public value capture, I would say. Yeah, there's a new discussion in the German context. Uh, they are discussing, uh, I just got an email this morning, <laughs> about hyperloops, which is a new type of uh, transportation infrastructure. It is kind of these tubes um, that are uh, yeah, where you create a, a vacuum so that uh, you can travel through the tubes with, with high speeds, uh, or even we call it ultra, ultra speed uh, infrastructure. You can travel 500, maybe even a thousand kilometers an hour. And then you can, uh, which is the same speed like planes, uh, and then you have an infrastructure uh, that is um, maybe safer than planes, maybe also uh, less ecologically damaging, uh, so you don't need uh, uh, emissions, so the CO2, uh, CO2 can be reduced. Uh, but that will definitely increase the prices to a large extent, also has safety uh, issues, uh, of course. So public value capture will um, will be very important. And in fact, they do capture that value because very close to the stations, you usually have transit oriented development. So there's a lot of private companies that are built close to the stations and they pay most of the tax uh, increase, uh, or actually they pay most of the tax close to that station and not the individual citizens that live there. Yeah. Thank you for Walter. So anybody from this room has a question maybe? Otherwise I would like to continue to the online participant, uh, participants. Anybody from students? We have a master students. We have, I think best, is there any bachelor student here? Oh, we have bachelor student and also PhD student is complete combination. From Ah, okay, please. Please mention your name and also from 
with student ID. This. Okay. Um, thank you for the opportunity for me to ask here. Um, my name is Wilden. I'm from uh, Bachelor of uh, Undergraduate uh, Planning in here in UNDIP. And I want to ask if, I'm sorry, the background is from what I see, the problem in Indonesia and most of uh, the big cities in Indonesia, as like uh, you have uh, said, is the lacking of infrastructure, if the lacking of public infrastructure in cities, like open spaces or other um, quality of land in cities, the qualities of space in cities, which are not improved for these past years or um, in the current development, because I think improvement in urban land is other than the um, basic infrastructures are not generating uh, in uh, private profits or private values. It only generates um, social or public values. So um, the context is um, very, and one of the examples is um, consolidations, land consolidations, or um, the land or urban decline in center of Semarang. Uh, they lack the uh, infrastructure of, or they lack the public quality. And I want to ask if improvements that are created whether it is by a private or the public um, through the development of a certain land can impose taxes on other property owners other than the prof uh, property owners here that develop it. Um, I want to ask if I want to develop some certain like health facilities like uh, puskesmas or schools or other um, public um, infrastructure or public land infrastructure, I can impose taxes on the nearby neighborhood on their property um, or their land taxes. So if there is any examples on um, land development that can impose taxes on other land or property, um, I think it will be beneficial for Indonesian cities. Thank you. Yeah, so, yeah. Yes, I, I understood the question. There's actually multiple questions there, I think. But uh, I think the one uh, question is um, maybe implicit in your question. Is it fair that uh, all people should pay for an improvement where only a few people will benefit? So um, if we invest in, uh, in Samarang, should somebody in Jakarta pay for that? Uh, or, or maybe uh, even further away, the rest of Indonesia, should they pay for any sort of improvement in Samarang? Um, I think there's two, two types of reasoning that you can have there. Um, you could say, well, only people that live in the area should pay for the improvements because they have the direct benefit uh, and they are maybe also the owner of that property. The advantage is that it's very clear who, who benefits and who pays. Uh, disadvantage is that many of those investments may actually cost so much money that those individual owners cannot pay for that. Uh, and so the counter argument is that any improvement in the center of Samarang or anywhere in Samarang is beneficial for the rest of Indonesia too, because they could 
if we look at it from the um, like an ecological service or like a public service, they could travel there for recreation, for tourism. They could do all sorts of things. And having happy Samarang people for Indonesia is benefiting the whole of Indonesia. So in that sense, the benefit is actually for the whole of Indonesia. We have the same issue in Germany that uh, after the reunification, a lot of money went to the reconstruction of the eastern part of Germany. And uh, obviously you need a lot of money for that. And the eastern Germans did not have that money. So most of the money came actually from Western Germany until today. So every salary in the whole of Germany, uh, there is a certain amount, a certain percentage of so-called solidarity tax. And that solidarity tax is to make sure that everybody in Germany has the same living standard. Uh, so the, we can also say it is kind of a spatial justice system that you create some sort of equal opportunities and equality for the whole of Germany so that every sort of increase of development in Germany is benefiting to the whole society and not just for the area where uh, where most of the profits uh, are. Most of the profits are actually in the south at the moment, no longer in the west of Germany. Uh, but why should only the south benefit from that and not the entire country? So, so that's why we have this solidarity tax and nobody actually debates that. Uh, they say, well, it's actually for the benefit of the whole of Germany. And there's even, uh, you see that that philosophy, Germany is carrying forward to Europe um, where uh, at the time that Italy and Spain and, and Greece were doing sort of economically badly, Germany was fostering the system of, okay, we should actually pay for their problems and redevelop so that we have happy Italians and Greek that can also contribute to a wealthy Europe in that sense. Uh, whereas other countries like the Netherlands said, well, that cost us a lot of money <laughs> and we don't benefit from it. Uh, so, but I think this solidarity tax in that system is a, is a relatively fair system. So in that sense, I think uh, public value capture also contributes to that. Uh, Okay, thank you for what it's also interesting because yeah, uh, it is depend on the who enjoy the benefit, right? I suppose yeah. If you all the all the country enjoy the benefit, then maybe you can apply for all the people yeah in the country uh, of the of uh, maybe for one infrastructure development yeah. As for instance, maybe for road toll development. So you cannot just maybe increase the tax for the people who are living in the uh, in this area, yeah, because people, all the people enjoy the roads. Maybe, yeah, maybe in one island on that. And yeah, nice. Uh, a nice question also. So I think we come to the the last question in this online participant. Uh, actually, we have two more questions, yeah. But let's try with the first question first. Uh, this is from student of our ma uh, of master student here. Uh, her name is Salma. He has a, a she has a question. Uh, she said, based on the presentation about the stairs model urban land development. That's explaining the use of agricultural land with land use only information. Is there a possibility that agricultural land prices will increase with the issue of sustainable consumption and production? Uh, yes, of course. You can also uh, improve agricultural land uh, to use it more efficiently or maybe in a land consolidation process. And then obviously the, the value of the land will increase. The system, um, just to go back to the system of Germany, the people that benefit from that, they also need to pay. So there are land consolidation projects with only five um, owners of land. And, um, or I know of one example where the total price for the investment in the infrastructure and the land itself was about 1 million. And that meant that every participant had to pay two to 300,000 of euros 
for the improvement. Uh, and many were farmers, but many of them said, yes, I do that. They agreed to that amount of money because they could see that that amount of money could be paid back in maybe 10 years of um, increase in profits. So they could see that in the long run. So there you also see sort of um, uh, investment with a private benefit and even private people are willing to pay for that uh, investment. Uh, so yeah, also for agricultural land. And it's usually the landowners that pay for that. Uh, yeah. yeah, it is interesting also in Germany, if you said something, what is rural development? Then normal people say it, what I learned, rural development is land consolidation. Oh, now you have to be careful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, don't speak to <laughs> Professor Margo. Yeah, yeah, that's what this is from Professor Margo's perception. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so we still have one question here, maybe another one from here. If you still have a question. Otherwise, I would like to read the last question from the online participant. Okay. Okay, we have one last question. Uh, from Biski Ayu Puja Lasenda. I think, oh yeah, she's also the master student from this program. Good afternoon, Professor Walter. I am Diski, student of, okay, Master of Urban Regional Planning, okay. Thank you for interesting lecture today. My question is, uh, in your opinion, how to respond the phenomenon of the economic value from limited land of coastal areas? Uh, is it uh, must include the interest, the coastal area, but must include the interest of the region community? That's the question. Yes, oh, that's a difficult one. Uh, <laughs> who benefits from an imp improvement of coastal areas? Uh, uh, I think. I will not be able to answer that uh, question fully because in coastal areas you have uh, many phenomena actually. Uh, there is obviously the protection of coastal areas or of coastal zones from, from floods, uh, tsunami, from ROPs as I had just learned this week. Um, there's also the touristic value of coastal areas, but there's also the economic value of coastal areas. I mean, I grew up close to the sea, uh, uh, Rotterdam uh, uh, being a major port in, in the Netherlands, uh, and there is purely economical, um, that, that value of the land. So, so there's many interests there. So who should actually pay for that and who should benefit from that? I think it's multiple. It is usually uh, of national interest or of regional interest. So uh, with multiple investments and therefore also multiple financial sources that, uh, that have to pay for that. Uh, I, I would say that's my short answer, but I guess there's many answers there. Yeah, yeah I think that was the, our last question in this uh, public lecture. <laughs> Uh, my question is already answered and also already there, yeah, from uh, the previous uh, first question from the online participant. But uh, I still have uh, one interest point, interesting point you mentioned about the, about the unseen people, the, the pictures, yeah. It is very, very interesting issue at the moment if you talk about the land use planning and so on. So you mentioned that all those kind of unseen people, they have to be, yeah, what do you call it, uh, uh, be the participants, mm -hmm. right, in this process, yeah. But we have also unseen people. Uh, if we think uh, on the other way around, these unseen people, they determine everything. Yeah, because in, <laughs> yeah, on, yeah, on both side, not only had to encourage, uh, encourage them to uh, participate for those kind of unseen people, maybe for uh, uh, ordinary people, yeah, for regular people, but for the powerful people, they are also unseen, but they determine everything. <laughs> That's normally happen if you deal with land use planning or special planning. 
<laughs> very good comment. I think. I'll, I'll pick that up. Yeah, yeah. unseen people are not just the poor people, but also the very rich and yeah. maybe the very powerful. Yes, uh -huh. thanks. Okay, so I think we have a very nice lecture today, and thank you all of you who already uh, be here this afternoon, and also our online participant. I suppose we have how many? How many participants? Fifth something, yeah? Oh, already they left out, yeah. Okay, thank you very much to all of you. So please give a big applause to Professor Walter today. Thank you very much. So before we leave this room, we can have a picture together. Oh, we can go from there. Oh yeah, please people in the Zoom room, please turn on your camera. We are going to make a picture if you're still there. Hopefully. Ah, yeah, okay. It's coming one by one. I think just put in the gallery mode. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we are waiting for your camera on. <laughs> Itu penggemar Pak Walter. <laughs> Fansnya Pak Walter. So, okay, people, we are waiting your camera. Yang lainnya jangan-jangan masih tidur. Uh -huh. Okay, selesai. So I just know that you just oh this that was a, a screenshot, yeah. Just takes the line and then you save the file. That's very easy. Print screen, yeah. Already done. Okay, thank you very much, and then see you again for the next lecture. Uh, we will have another lecture on Thursday mostly for students and also for uh, teachers yeah lectures for publication and so on yang di sini ya dari sini toh berkumpul bersama oke okay, let's go Oh, next. Yeah. 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 Yeah